Chapter Nineteen of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Nineteen, Suggestions of Evil. The crowd in the marketplace and in the streets of Ashburton began to thin as the afternoon crept on. In vain did the showmen blow their trumpets, ring their bells, and invite to their entertainments. Those who had come to the fair had spent their loose cash. The proprietors of the stalls offered their wares at reduced prices, but found few purchasers. Young men who had been hired by the farmers swaggered about singing or shouting, some tipsy, others merely on the road to tipsiness. The ostlers in the inns were harnessing horses to the traps, market carts, gigs, dog carts, that had brought in the farmers and their wives. Empty wagons were departing. The roads were full of streams of people flowing homeward to the surrounding villages. Pasco Pepperill started with the schoolmaster. He had surrendered Kate to her father. The reins were in his hand, and he had whipped the cob when he saw Coker, the man from whom he had bought the wool, coming towards him. The blood rushed into Pepperill's face. "'How do you do?' asked the farmer. "'Going home?' "'I be,' answered Pasco, with constrained anger. "'You'll find all the wool there. I sent off the lot this morning. Three wagon-loads. "'Why did you not inform me, and I would have waited for it, and not come to the fair? "'I did not know how the weather might be, and I wished to be rid of it,' Coker laughed. This angered Pasco further, and losing command of himself, he said, "'Twas scurvy!' that selling me at such a price when you knew wool was down. That was your concern, each man for himself. But I reckon you've made a worse bargain at Brimps, if, as they tell me, you have bought the wood. How so? Is not the timber first rate? Oh, the timber is good enough. Then what is wrong? Have you been to Brimps? No, but Quorm has. "'Then you don't know the road. "'It is thus.' "'Coker made a motion with his hand up and down. "'The waves of the sea, mountains high, is nothing to it. "'And bad, the road is. "'Lor, bless you. "'The cost of moving the timber when cut will swallow up all the profits. Hoof! "'The distance from Ashburton is only three miles. "'Better ten on a decent road. "'You'll never get the timber drawn, or, if you do— farewell to all profits. But when you have got it to Ashburton, who will buy it there? Oh, Quorm has an idea of disposing of the oak to the government, selling it to the dockyard at Devonport. How far off is that? Some five and twenty miles. And over the moor, Coker laughed. If I don't sell the oak, I am a... Pasco's face was as red as blood. He checked himself from the confession that he would be a ruined man, and said between his teeth, "'I will never speak to Quorm again. He's led me into a pretty quandary.' "'Quorm? He's a jack-o'-lantern. Don't trust he.' Coker waved his hand, and, still laughing, went his way to the stable-yard to get his cob. Pasco whipped his horse and drove homewards. His lips were closed, his brows knitted, he looked straight before him at the ears of his horse. He was in no disposition to speak. Nor, for the matter of that, was his companion. Bramber was thinking of Kitty, of the uncongenial surroundings, the hot-headed father, running himself and his brother-in-law into speculative ventures that must lead them to ruin, of the uncle, boastful, conceited, and withal stupid, of the hard, selfish aunt. He saw that young Pook admired her, and this did not altogether please Bramber. Pook might be well off and amiable, but he was dull of intellect, a bore, and could never be a suitable companion to the eager Kitty, whose mind was greedy for knowledge, and whose tastes were those of a class above that in which she was cast. The admiration of Jan Pook brought on her a contrariety. It had involved her in the quarrel between Jan and Noah, and had roused the jealousy of Rose Ash. 
As the trap passed out of Ashburton, many a salutation was cast at Pepperell, but he hardly acknowledged any. He put up his hand and beat his hat down over his brows, then lashed savagely at his cob. All at once something arrested his eye, and he instinctively drew up, then muttered and whipped his brute again. What he had observed was a little plate, affixed to a house, with the title of the insurance company on it, with which he had that day had dealings. I wonder, thought Pasco, what that house is insured for. Not for twelve hundred pounds, I'll swear. Then a sense of bitterness rose in his heart against his brother-in-law for drawing him into this expense of insuring his property. He had that day expended all the gold he had about him in paying the first premium. There remained only some silver in one pocket, and coppers in the other. Where was he to find the money for the payment of the oaks he had bought? Where was he to meet the bill for the wool? The tanner would not pay enough for the bark to cover the cost of rending. Corm had told him that the sap rose badly, and that it would involve much labor and waste of time to attempt to bark the trees. Fevered with anxiety and disappointment, Pasco thrashed his cob savagely, and sent it along at its fullest pace, whirling past the gigs and wagons returning from the fair, and giving the drivers hardly time to get on one side to avoid him. He relieved his breast by swearing at them for their sluggishness in making way, and some retaliated with oaths, as, in order to escape him, they ran into the hedge or over a heap of stones. Presently his horse slackened speed, as it reached a sharp ascent, and there Pasco met an empty wagon, with, Coker, dart meat, on it. He stopped his panting horse, and shouted to the driver of the team, and asked whence he came. "'I've been to your place, Coombe Cellars,' answered the wagoneer. "'Master sent me with a load of fleeces. "'Did my wife give you anything?' "'Not a glass of cider,' answered the man. "'We had to unload and do the work of hoisting into the warehouse ourselves. "'No one was about.' "'She left it for me. "'She knew you would meet us.' "'Tossing his head to shake off the depression that had come upon him, "'and with a flash of his vanity through the gloom, "'he put his hand in his pocket and drew out a couple of shillings.' There, said he, you'd have had more, but I have spent most of my cash at the fair. Buying, 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 that's my trade. Go and drink a glass to my health. Then he drove on. On descending the hill another wagon was encountered. This was also one that had conveyed fleeces to Coombe Cellars. Pasco gave this driver a couple of shillings. Then he turned to Bramber and said, Two years of wool. I paid as much as thirteen pence a pound, and I can't sell it at ten pence. They say it is going down to seven pence. That is nearly half what I gave. A loss to me of six pence a pound. I have bought three wagon load. A good sheep may have sixteen pounds on his back, but the average is ten or eleven. Coker must keep a couple of hundred. You're the schoolmaster. Reckon that up. Two hundred sheep at eleven. I'm not a quick man at figures myself. Nothing can be simpler than that calculation. Two thousand two hundred. Ah, but two years' wool? Well, that is four thousand four hundred. And I have lost, say, six pence a pound. Then you lose a hundred and ten pounds by the transaction. Think of that. A hundred and ten pounds. Say a hundred and twenty. That is something for a man to lose and make no account of. The vanity of the man was flattered by the thought of the amount of his loss. And then, said he, there was what Coker said about the oak. I've undertaken to lay out two hundred pounds on that, and there is the felon and carton, say another hundred. Suppose I lose this also. That is a matter of three hundred. With the wool, four hundred and twenty pound. I reckon, schoolmaster, you've never had the figuring of so much money as I am losing." Bramber looked round at Pasco with surprise. He could not understand the sort of pride that was manifesting itself in the man. "'Are you able to meet such losses? "'If not, I can but fail. "'It's something to fail for a good sum. "'But I'll not fail. "'I'm full of resources. 
he beat the horse. I shall sell the wool. It will go up. I shall sell the timber at a good figure, and pocket a thousand pounds. I am sorry I did not give those men half a crown each, but I have spent most of my money, and— Crash! He drove against a post and upset the trap. Pasco staggered to his feet. Schoolmaster, are you hurt? No. Walter sprang to the horse and seized its head. It would have been best had I broken my neck and finished so, said Pepperell. Then he regretted the sudden outburst of despair, and added, So some folks might have said, but I've disappointed em. I may have a chuck down, but I'm up again in a jiffy. That's been my way all along, and will be to the end. One of the shafts was broken, and there ensued delay whilst it was being patched up with rope. Then, when they were able to pursue their career, Pasco was constrained to drive more carefully and less rapidly. Night was coming on as they neared Newton Abbot. "'I'll tell you what it is,' said Pasco. "'I'm uncommon hungry, and I'll just go into the first public house and have a mouthful of something, and you shall do the same. The cob is a bit shaken with that spill, and I'll have the shaft fastened up firmer before we proceed. What say you? Here's the crown and anchor. How the place has changed! Aha! It is insured at the same office as I am. Why, bless my life, the old inn was a ramshackle sort of place. Pepperell descended from his trap, and gave instructions to the ostler what he was to do to the broken shaft. "'I'll pay you well if you do your work,' said he. Then to Bramber, "'Come in. Cold meat, and bread and cheese, and a glass of ale. We need refreshment, and the house looks as if it could provide it. Don't be concerned about the cost. I don't suppose you are over flush with cash. I'll pay. You are my guest.' Pasco's self-conceit was a constant spring of energy in him. Dashed his spirits might be by disaster, but he speedily recovered his buoyancy, owing to this characteristic element in his nature. It is said that the fertility of Manitoba is due to the fact that below the surface the soil is frozen hard in winter, and during the summer the warmth of the sun penetrating ever farther thaws the ice, and thus water incessantly wells up, nourishing and moistening the roots of the corn. There was a perennial body of self-esteem deep in the heart of Pasco Pepperell, and this fed and sustained in vigorous growth a harvest of generosity in dealing with his inferiors, of liberality towards the poor, of display in his mercantile transactions, that imposed on the public and made it suppose that he was prosperous in his many affairs. The landlord came to the door. "'How do you do, Mr. Pepperell? Glad to see you. You do not often favor me.' "'Well, no. If I come this way I mostly stop at the Golden Sun. You see, you are rather near my home. I hope this, though your first visit, is not the last. I dare say not. What brings me now is an accident. Could you let us have some supper?' "'Certainly. What would you like? Cold beef? Cold mutton?' or chops and potatoes. You have a supply of good things. I'm obliged to have. I get plenty of custom now. What? More than of old? Oh, double since I have rebuilt my house. I see. The place is completely changed. You had but a poor sort of a tavern. Yes, and now. The landlord looked round and smiled, and put his hand into his waistband. Middling good, I think. Uncommon, said Pasco. I suppose it is the better look of the house that has brought better custom. That's just it. I had only common wayfarers before, mostly tramps. Now, the better sort altogether. Where I just turned over a penny before, I turn over a shilling now. So you rebuilt your public house to get better business? Well, you see, I couldn't help myself. The old place caught fire and burned down. And it did not ruin you? Dear me, no, I was insured. So, that set you on your legs again? It was the making of me, was that fire. How long had you been insured before you were burnt out? Well, now, that is the curious part of the story, said the landlord. 
Hardly a week. And how did your place catch fire? There was a tramp. I refused to take him in, as he had no money. That was the best stroke of business I ever did in my life. He hid himself in a sort of lean-to there was over the pigs' houses, joined on to the house, and in it was straw. I reckon he went to sleep there with his pipe alight, and he set fire to the place. Was he burnt? No, he got away all right, but the straw set fire to the rafters, and they ran into the wall. It was a poor old wall, with no mortar in it, and the rafters came in just under those of the upstairs chambers, so that when the roof of the linhay was afire, it set the house in a blaze too. That was how it all came about. And a good job for you. It was the making of me. Pasco was silent through the meal. He seemed hardly to taste what he was eating. He gulped down his food and drank copiously. Bramber was relieved when he left. He was afraid Pepperell would drink more than he could bear. At the entrance to the village he left the cart and thanked Pasco for the lift. Pepperell drove on to Coombe Cellars. As he came up he saw his wife standing at the door with a light in her hand. Pasco, is that you? Who else? So, you are home at last. There has been the coal merchant here. He swears he will bring you no more, and that, unless you pay up this month, he will set the lawyers on you. Pepperell flung himself from his cart. Heavens, he said, looking sullenly at his stores. If they would but burn. Burn? What burn? asked Mrs. Pepperell sharply. Do you think you cannot leave the house for a day but some mischief must come on it? As if I were not to be trusted, and everything lay with you. I did not mean that, Zara. Then what did you mean? I meant that it might have got me out of difficulties. What might? Pasco did not answer. I should like to know how, if the store were to be burnt, any good would come of that. You've been drinking, Pasco. I'm insured, he said in a low tone. Oh, it has come to that, has it? Heaven help us! The woman beat her face with her open palms, turned, and went within. End of chapter 19